My name is Shibli Talhami. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a professor at the University of Maryland. And I have an outstanding panel of accomplished leaders and thinkers uh, to address the question of pluralism and cosmopolitanism, even as we're facing more sectarianism and division, uh, certainly in the Middle East, but I think across uh, Muslim countries broadly. Uh, when um, Will McCant um, contacted me, asked me uh, that he wanted to do a panel on pluralism and cosmopolitanism, um, I thought it would be a good idea to mine some of the data that I have been collecting in the Arab world uh, about cosmopolitanism, which I hadn't really uh, accessed because I, I didn't uh, focus my study on that aspect particularly. Um, so what I'd like to do before I introduce my panelists and start the panel uh, is present to you uh, some interesting findings uh, that we have found over the years uh, with regard to um, cosmopolitan identity in, in the Arab world. Um, I have been studying identity for a quarter century, I've written about it quite a bit, and I have also been doing polling about identity in the Arab world. And when I say polling about identity, um, essentially understanding that most people um, have complex identities. So when we say uh, we have a sectarian conflict, Sunni Shia, uh, it, it's kind of a very complicated issue because it doesn't take into account that although people feel very strongly about their sect, so the Shia feel very strongly about the Shiaism, or Sunni could feel very strongly about their Sunni identity, everyone has multiple identities. So uh, a Sunni is at once a Sunni and a Muslim and an Arab and an Iraqi or a, an Egyptian uh, and a citizen of the world and much more. So the real question isn't uh, whether or not there is some sectarian elements to identity. It's always been there. It's not like something new that we now, now face. We've always had it from, in the case of Sunni Shia, divide since the beginning of Islam. So the real question is under what circumstances do people embrace one aspect of their identity over the others? That's really the interesting question. And over a decade prior to the Arab uprisings and since the Arab uprisings, um, I have tried to get at that question of uh, knowing that people are all these things often, uh, which one do they favor at any given time? And, and, and we gave them the options of uh, Arab, Muslim, citizen of their country, citizen of the world, and in countries where there are multiple sects like Lebanon, there are sectarian options as to which one do they embrace first at any given time to see if there's change over time. And in general, um, putting aside the issue of cosmopolitanism and citizen of the world uh, answer, what we found is what most people have found who did research on this in the, in the uh, decade prior to the Arab uprisings, is that there was a, an increase in the assertion of Islamic identity over the decade and a decline in the assertion of identification with the state. This is not only my finding, this has been generally a broad finding uh, in the literature. And in my own work, I have explained that by suggesting that it, at least in part, it is explained by the fact that most Arabs and Muslims felt that Islam itself was under assault. That even aside from people who will embrace it under normal circumstances as their top priority, there was a rise beyond that core group, uh, explained mostly by a sense that Arabs and Muslims interpreted the American war on terrorism after 9-11 and the Iraq war in particular uh, as a war on Islam and Muslims. And there was in a way a rallying behind the Islamic identity even aside from the core identity that most people hold. In fact, my own view of identity is that it is a function of a sense of threats on the one hand and possibilities on the other hand, relationship with the other. And so in that sense, if you look at it that way, you can understand how people often assert their identity. Uh, in cases of sectarian countries like Iraq and, um, and Lebanon, although I don't do surveys in Iraq, others have done so, I've done surveys in Lebanon, it's interesting that the countries that have most sectarianism, you know, ethnically and religiously, especially Lebanon, uh, every single sect says that the first top identity is actually Lebanese over their sect. 
In fact, the assertion of state identity is higher than any other country in the Arab world, in large part because I think people are fearful for losing Lebanon, that they're rallying behind Lebanon. Even as they behave sometimes in sectarian ways, it's not necessarily the one they prefer. And so I suggest that there is a dynamic relationship. So with that in mind, uh, I sought to look back at the data I had uh, to see what kind of results I had in the number of people who asserted uh, citizen of the world identity over everything else. So because that's an option I gave people, um, how many of you uh, uh, would, would choose citizen of the world as your top priority among the options of identity that you have? And frankly, one reason I haven't looked at the data is that for uh, the first eight, nine years of my research, I had only one to two percent of people say they embraced citizen of the world. It was not particularly meaningful. There was not, you know, most of the, most of the difference was uh, state identity, Islamic identity. That's where we had the change. We didn't have anything happening on uh, assertion of citizen of the world identity until we had the Arab uprisings. And so what I want to show, show you is something interesting with regard to what the Arab uprisings, at least in the first two years, when people were much more optimistic about the consequence, uh, what happened uh, to their notions of identity with citizens of the world? Uh, and then try to explain that and put that out there as a piece of information that I hope uh, to um, engage my, uh, my co-panelists on. So let me just show you, first of all, um, this is um, a, uh, a graph that you see up there uh, uh, in six Arab countries that includes Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, Morocco, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and the United Arab Emirates uh, from 2004 to 2011. You can see that the top graph uh, green is um, uh, the Muslim identity, and you can see at the bottom blue graph uh, is citizen of the world. Uh, if you look at 2008-2009, uh, it was very, very low. Now, this is, by the way, this is not, this is, the, these graphs are a uh, com combination of people who say uh, uh, that any given identity is either the first choice or second choice because we combine them together, first and, and second choice. So you can see we have an incredible spike in the number of people uh, who say citizen of the world uh, is their first or second choice. Up to 20% of the public in 2000, going from the end of 2010 to the end of 2011. This, this um, uh, poll was done the end of 2011. And uh, uh, to confirm that later on in 2012, we did a similar poll in Egypt, and we found the same results roughly, uh, where the negligible uh, percentage of people who said citizen of the world early uh, has spiked uh, even for number one from 3% to 9%. Uh, so we've had some interesting uh, results with regard to that. Uh, and you can see here um, just uh, the combination of, of the two first and second identity also in, in uh, bar form went up uh, from 6% in 2010 uh, to 20% in 2011. Um, and um, you can see uh, as just a first choice, it went from 4% to 9% in 2010, 2011. And as I said, there was a comparable change in Egypt in 2012. So we had, we, we spanned two years of those results. Now, I want to suggest to you that some of this had to do with how Arabs interpreted the attitudes of the rest of the world. In, in contrast to the previous decade, how they saw the solidarity and the embrace of the rest of the world of the initial days of the Arab uprising, particularly the pictures in Tahrir Square. This is a freedom and democracy movement, and, it, and there was a dramatic embrace across the board that actually empowered people who were more inclined to identify with the rest of the world. With the rest of the world. Uh, we see that even in the American polling, uh, in terms of the attitudes uh, right after the uprisings in, in, in a poll I did in the United States in, in, in April 2011, uh, we had 39% uh, said their view of Arab people improved. Um, only 6% said, uh, you know, uh, decree, their favorable views decreased uh, in comparison. Uh, we also found that, uh, in general, uh, American 
public views of Egyptians after Tahrir Square remarkably increased. We had 70% of uh, the American people say uh, they had a favorable view of the Egyptian people uh, after Tahrir Square. Uh, and um, we also find that, um, let me just, uh, I just want to go through this uh, very quickly here because I want to, um, um, so I suggest not only that the rest of the world uh, had expressed solidarity with the Arabs, but that those Arabs who were more connected with the rest of the world were more inclined to assert citizen of the, the world identity. So for example, uh, if you look at people who uh, use the internet uh, 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 more frequently, uh, almost daily, uh, they have uh, much more increase in their assertion of citizen of the world identity than people who never use it. Um, uh, the same thing with the age group. Uh, younger people tended increased more from three to nine as opposed to five to eight. Uh, um, and uh, those people who had access to foreign language websites that link them even more to the rest of the world, including English, French, and other languages, uh, as you can see here, um, had um, uh, far more, um, they, they were far more inclined uh, to, uh, to assert uh, citizen of the world identity. So what I'm suggesting is that um, um, although um, this is not a, if, if, a if, theory as such, it is more a set of observations. Uh, there seemed to be a very interesting indication in the early days of the Arab uprisings that contrast with the previous decade, with Arab, Arabs and Muslims f felt under assault, whereas in the Arab uh, uprisings of the first two years, not only did they feel empowered, but they felt a sense of solidarity with the rest of the world. We actually see with that a, an interesting increase in the assertion of citizens of the world. And I um, certainly start with that, not in order to say that's what we have now. Uh, I see that in order to show that uh, identity is fluid, uh, that sectarian identity is often an outcome of conflict much more than it is a cause of conflict, uh, that uh, people's identity is always a function of relations with the others and their assessment of the prospects of those relations with the others. And so in that sense, the issue of pluralism, what people choose uh, to be their core identity and whether or not they want to um, assert an identity that, that is much more encompassing uh, of other people around them uh, is fluid uh, and has to be interpreted uh, that way. And so joining me on the panel to discuss this broad question um, are um, very accomplished people. Um, some of them, one of them, you have already met earlier uh, today, uh, Ambassador Marwan Mashir. Um, uh, I'm not going to read all the bios. Uh, they're in the, uh, uh, your pamphlet. Uh, you can look at them, but I'm just going to say a couple of things about them. Um, um, Ambassador Mashir, as you know, is uh, currently the Vice President uh, of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, where he oversees uh, research uh, in Washington and Beirut on the Middle East. Uh, and he also has got an office uh, for the Carnegie in, in Jordan. Um, uh, many of you know him as a leading Arab diplomat, uh, having served as a, a deputy prime minister and a foreign minister uh, of Jordan. But more with regard to our issue, uh, not only did he have to deal with it as uh, deputy uh, prime minister in Jordan, but his most recent book is really about the battle of pluralism in the That's Arab right. world. So this is something he's thought about intellectually as well as had to engage uh, with as a statesman. Uh, I also uh, i am really pleased to be uh, joined by Marizia Lebidi Meza. Uh, uh, she is a member of the Tunisian parliament uh, with the Nahda party, and since 2006, uh, she has also served as co-president of Religions for Peace, the largest international coalition of representatives uh, from, the world, uh, from the world's largest religions. Uh, she's also been active in women's group, and it's really wonderful to have her here talk about a particular experience uh, that, we're, that we're facing, especially in Tunisia, but she will talk uh, even more broadly than that. Uh, and finally, um, our American representative, uh, 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 Shaq, uh, Sharik Zafar, uh, who is the special representative 
uh, to, the, to the Muslim communities at the U.S. State Department, uh, where he's responsible for driving Secretary Kerry's engagement with Muslim communities around the world on issues of mutual interest in support of shared goals and in advance of U.S. foreign policy. Um, those of you who also uh, uh, look at his uh, uh, CV, he has a uh, very long experience in uh, other positions of the U.S. government, particularly related uh, to Arab and Muslim communities. So it's, it's really an honor uh, to, uh, uh, to be joined by this group, and I will join them and start the conversation. Um, again, I welcome you all. I know that um, um, the first panel, which was an excellent panel that we've had here, in some ways touched on the issue of sectarianism and pluralism inevitably because those are related to the strategic issue that the U.S. is facing and the region is facing. Um, so uh, there were many questions that were asked that obviously were not answered. Uh, but I'm going to start with you, uh, Ambassador Masher. Uh, particularly when you um, wrote your book, um, which was really about the Arab, uh, you call it the, the second awakening because of uh, the first awakening, uh, uh, that you were focused principally on the Arab battle for pluralism. This is a battle that you felt very strongly about for many years. You've spoken uh, about it while you were in office. You, you, you've wrote, written about it. First of all, um, what is your assessment uh, of the prospect of pluralism as you see um, all this integration that has taken place, in, certainly here in the, in the Middle East in particular. Uh, thank you, Shibli. Before I talk about the assessment, I feel I need to define what I mean by pluralism, yeah. because pluralism means different things to different people. And I see pluralism as encompassing four main elements. Political pluralism, meaning the right of peaceful, and I always stress peaceful, peaceful political forces to engage in the system and to have a peaceful rotation of power at all times so that no one party, no one for, uh, force can deny others the right to politically operate. Then I talk about religious pluralism. We are uh, an Arab world where uh, we have a diversity of religious sects and uh, the freedom of people to believe in what they want or not to believe in anything for that matter should be enshrined in, uh, in, uh, in their uh, constitutions. I talk about cultural pluralism. The Arab world is not comprised of Arabs only. We have different groups uh, that are all part of this region, Kurds, Armenians, Amazigh, etc. And finally, I talk about gender pluralism. And what I mean by that is equality for women. We cannot be talking about a pluralistic society if we are allowing ourselves to discriminate against one particular sect in our society, particularly if that sect is 50% of the population. So these are, to me, the four elements that must be present when we talk about pluralistic societies. Is there a force in the Arab world, at least a mobilized force, that believes in all four simultaneously or that has practiced all four simultaneously? I think the answer is clear. If that force exists, it is minute. It is extremely small. But I argue that this is principally what the battle should be for if we are to arrive at prosperous societies. If we look at an experience of anywhere around the world, it is clear that while where diversity is celebrated, prosperity comes uh, 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 along. Absolutely. Uh, the, but the, the pluralistic society, the belief in pluralism is not a sufficient condition to arrive at prosperity, but it is, necess it is definitely a necessary one, without which uh, uh, no such possibility to arrive at pluralism, I think, is present. You look at the situation in the Arab world today, and the one exception, and I'm glad we have uh, a, a member of parliament from Tunisia to talk about this, the one exception is Tunisia. That doesn't mean that Tunisia is out of the woods or that they have been able to you know, uh, uh, solve all the problems, but it does mean that they have found a way to divert the issue from the rest of the Arab world where it is principally today a uh, a battle between secular and Islamist elements. 
basically, to a battle for pluralism, in which they have been able to arrive at a constitution that assures all sects of society, all forces of society, political, economic, cultural, etc., that their place in society is going to be guaranteed for all times. And that despite the clear and, and stark and strong differences between the secular and Islamist elements in society in Tunisia, still they were able to arrive at a social contract that basically assures people uh, of their place in society. That is to me the number one uh, sort of uh, uh, step in any development towards pluralistic societies is new social contracts in the Arab world. The social contract that existed in the Arab world has largely been, you know, the denial of political, uh, uh, f uh, the denial of political rights for citizens in return for the state taking care of their social and economic sort of needs. That, of course, has not happened. And development has not taken part in the Arab world to that extent. We do need social context. We need to trump national identities over sub-identities in the region. You've mentioned the element of, uh, or, or the observation that, uh, that uh, uh, it is not, uh, you know, uh, that sectarianism is an outcome and not a cause. I think there is another element that has also uh, basically encouraged sub-identities in the Arab world at the expense of national identities, which is the lack of good governance. If people don't feel that the state is responsive to their needs, they go to their religion, they go to their tribe, they go to their, to their place of origin, and through people there, they, they, they are able to address their grievances to the state better than if they go to their own government. And that is something that is clear all around the Arab world. There's nowhere that is clearer than this than in Lebanon. And we also have a member of parliament from Lebanon that, that can address this as well. If the state is able to apply the rule of law and to engage in good governance and to show citizens that they are treated equally, whether they are Sunni or Shiite, whether they are Muslim or Christian, whether they are conservative or liberal, or whether they are men or women, if the state is able to show that the citizens are, are treated equally, then I think we would have, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, moved a good step towards instituting pluralistic societies. I have no illusion of the fact that, in my view, a pluralistic society is going to take generations in the Arab world to emerge. We are not talking about years. We are not even talking about decades. We are talking about a generation or two. And that necessarily implies that we need a new educational system in the region. So far, the educational system in the region or, or, or the focus on education has all been on quantity of education. Nothing much has been done about the quality of education to move away from a you know, road system, from a system that gives knowledge in a very uh, 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 narrow manner where, 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 where facts are always treated as absolute, where people do not engage in critical thinking, where people do, are not allowed to question where the very principle of diversity is suppressed, how can you, uh, you know, hope to develop pluralistic societies if people in their, from, from the time they are born are not taught either to respect other points of view or to engage in any kind of criti critical thinking? There's a study that uh, Booz Allen did in Saudi Arabia that showed that if the Saudi government does everything right about education, everything in terms of be teaching people critical thinking skills and all that, it will take 45 years for the results to start to be seen. So we are not talking here about things that can be addressed uh, uh, quickly. Uh, Tunisia, fortunately, whether the experience can be transported or, or not is another story, but Tunisia has at least shown us that it is possible. It is possible under certain conditions for a region that has not really known pluralism. We are a pluralistic region, but we're not exercising pluralism. 
uh, it is possible to move to towards such societies. I'll stop. Well, I'm going to follow up on this, but before that, I just want to. I know that we have uh, viewers uh, on the web, uh, and uh, some uh, may uh, uh, have some questions through uh, Twitter. I just want to say that uh, the hashtag uh, for the U.S. Islamic World Forum uh, is U.S. Islam uh, 15. That is uh, uh, number mark uh, U.S. Islam. 15, uh, one, one word. Uh, so please, uh, those of you who are watching and want to submit questions, uh, we're going to, you're going to have an opportunity to, uh, to have these questions asked at the end of, of the panel. Uh, before I turn to the other panels, I want to push you on one question here uh, because it really is central. Um, let's assume that we agree with you that Tunisia is the good case. Um, some people disagree with that, by the way. Uh, but let's assume that's the case. Um, the real question, of course, is um, what explains their success? Now, meaning, why is it that the others have failed? I mean, who intervenes in the process to make sure this happens? Why is it that society could create a bargain? What is it that doesn't, uh, that other countries didn't have that didn't make it possible uh, of, of the Arab uprising, whether it's Libya or, or or Yemen, or Syria, or Egypt, or any of them. So we we can argue about the causes, and there are many. There is a balance of forces in Tunisia. The Islamist and the status quo forces were not the only ones. You had a middle class. You had third forces like labor unions. You had a long history of, for example, uh, women movements in the country. You had Bourguiba, who uh, actually played a part. You had an Islamist party that was moderate in outlook. I mean, we can go through the reasons. To me, that's not the important issue. It is important to understand the reason. To me, the Tunisians have shown that it is possible at all, because there are many in the region that will argue that religion and pluralism don't work, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, democracy is not fit for the Arab world, that uh, this, you know, I mean, you have so many arguments yeah. against it. The important thing for me is that the Tunisians set a precedent. It might take 50 years for the second country, you know, to do what the Tunisians did. It might, and I'm serious, I'm not exaggerating. It might take 50 years, but at least it is possible. Yes, I want to come back to this and perhaps push you a little bit more, but I want to go to the panels first, because this particular question, doesn't it really matter what you would give advice to people to do in the short term? And who do you give advice to? Who's the key party that can make this happen? Uh, otherwise, we just wait historically. Uh, but we're, but we're, people are being asked to suggest steps to make take policies. So we, you need to figure out a way of, fit, you know, to whom do you make a recommendation and what uh, kind of recommendation? I'll come back to that. But I'm going to go with Marizia for now on um, your take on these same issues, particularly from the Tunisian experience. Mm -hmm. Shukran. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سأتكلم بالإنجليزية هذا ما تفهمنا عليه في هذا في هذه المائدة yeah I'm going to speak in English this is what we agreed upon بس ماشا you you make you made my presentation even easier well I think that in the case of Tunisia Tunisia is not as uh, Mr. Marzouk said this morning, we don't want to uh, introduce ourselves or perceive ourselves as an exception. We are just a country that has some historic evolving and that gave this result today. And I think that historical factors make Tunisia a more homogeneous country than many other Arab countries on the level of ethnicity. We don't have too many different or conflicting ethnicity in Tunisia. Of course, we have Berbers or Amazigh and Arabs and even people come from Turkey, from Andalusia, from Malta, etc. But uh, the encounter or let's say the melting pot was, it worked during history. And we don't all, uh, also have too many uh, religious communities or madahib or sec, uh, let's say different uh, section or uh, like uh, Shia and Sunnah. Uh, we are in majority Sunni and Maliki. We have uh, an important by history, not only by number, uh, Jewish community 
And uh, as long as I remember and whatever were the political or, or social uh, conflicts in Tunisia, they were respected as Tunisian, first of all. Of course, during, of course, the Palestinian Israel problems we, we had some, let's say, uh, moment of crisis and some of them left, but they are considered as Tunisian. So there is not really a problem of religion. So if we uh, tackle the issue of pluralism, certainly it must be from a political point of view. And I really appreciate that also the, the, the point of view of men and women, gender equality. Yes, this is also a, a very interesting question. And uh, this homogeneity of the society was reinforced by the modern state through educational system, through even administrative division of Tunisia. For example, in Tunisia is divided in wilaya, that is, uh, 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 and even big tribes were separated from on two or three wilayas. That you say that it re this reduces a lot the link between tribes, but we did have another, let's say, discrepancy and difficulty is, and it emerged as far as, let's say, the, the history of modern Tunisia evolves, the differences, or let's say the frustrated identities between regions, the rich regions and the poor regions. This was one of the causes of the revolution. And we have also some other frustrated, let's say, identities. Uh, for example, the uh, people referring to Islam, they were marginalized by modern society, or referring to Arab word, nationalist, and even some also leftist trade unionist referring to social justice and working class. And if we look at the political, let's say, uh, uh, scene in Tunisia, we will distinguish that those who were and the, the, the opposition to the regime of Bourguiba and Ben Ali, they were made of these three big families. And they asked since the early 70s, Ahmed al-Mistiri, the founder of social and democratic mo democrat movement, he split from the Hezb the, the, the party of Bourguiba, and he said, in, sim to simplify, modernity is not enough, we need democracy and we need pluralism. And if we refer, for example, to the, uh, the creation of another party, which, which was at the time called Mouvement de Tendance Islamique, Islamic Tendency Movement, I remember that in June 81, in a declaration, uh, Rashid al Ghanoushi said, pluralism is the right of the Tunisian people. We need pluralism. We must uh, offer or give our uh, people the opportunity to say that it's diversity and to express this diversity in creating political parties and contributing to power. And uh, I think there is a very important date in Tunisia. In October 2005, 18th of October, the pact between opposition to Ben Ali, opposition leaders living in Tunisia and those living outside of Tunisia. In this pact, and it is very important pact, they fixed te about 10 points around which the opposition gathered and fought for liberty and against despotism. And one of these points was pluralism and peaceful alternation to power. And of course, human rights, democracy, etc. So political pr uh, pluralism was and is still a demand of the political class in Tunisia and of the people. And after the revolution, the main test for all of us, the family referring to secularism and the, family, the political family referring to Islam is now, how are we going to build pluralism together? And let us be frank, we had a fight and it was not easy. 
to make room for the other and to envisage each other as partners. But we learned. We learned through crisis, of course, and even a very harsh crisis uh, after the political assassinations. But we learned through dialogue. And through the presence and the role of the civil society, because the civil society in Tunisia has a high political conscience. And they were very active in pushing political parties, first of all, to recognize each other. I think pluralism in matter of politics is a matter of recognition. Do we recognize the other, even if he or she is my competitor? Once the competition is end, when the, once the elections is over, can I consider him as a partner in building Tunisia? I think we have three main steps to do, to consolidate, to reaffirm pluralism that is now, it's a newborn, uh, let's say, democracy and a newborn pluralism in Tunisia. First of all, continue dialogue. Any crisis, whatever is its, let's say, harshness, can be settled by dialogue. We experience it in constitution, we experience it in national, what we call national debate or dialogue. And f second, all political families shall renounce to excluding the other. We were about to pass a law, the law of political exclusion, and we didn't. And I'm so happy that we didn't because it would have made the situation even more complicated. Then we have to transmit this spirit of consensus, dialogue, r uh, considering the other as a competitor and not as an enemy, to transform it into a culture, a political culture, and to disseminate it. We are, we are in process. And finally, we have to, in a way, I think not only Tunisian, but the international community, help the Tunisian democracy to deliver, because to, to, to be successful in building a political pluralism and democracy is not enough. We have to, find, to provide jobs, development, and dignity. The revolution was a revolution of dignity. And of course, to fight violence and terrorism because we cannot, we cannot, absolutely not, build a pluralist country with violent groups imposing a way of life or a way of ideas by force. So we have to unite against violence. Um, it's very interesting. I just want to push you on, on a couple of things, if I understood mm -hmm, them correctly, please. and correct me if I didn't, uh, if I'm misrepresenting your views. You seem to put a lot, place a lot of weight uh, on a pre-existing sense of citizenship uh, that preceded the Arab yeah. uprising. Uh, and that's interesting given the fact that the assumption was that uh, Ibn Ali was uh, one of the most repressive rulers against the Islamist. And so how do you, how do you reconcile those two? And second, if I may, uh, this, the second weight you place is on Ghanoushi personally. And, and that may be the case, but was that an accident of history? Uh, had you had a different uh, leader who may have uh, taken the Islamic movement in a different direction, would the outcome have been different? So is this a uh -huh. really mostly an accident of history rather than something that is structural about Tunisia? Well, I think that Tunisian people, due to, let's say, the era of Bourguiba and the public school, developed, let's say, a culture of citizenship, even if there was frustration in the citizenship. Even if, if during the, early, the era of Ben Ali, many Tunisians indeed felt that they are not really citizens of a country that, in which they had no rights. But let me tell you that it's not only a matter of leaders. Yes, the leadership of Rashid al Ghanoushi, not only as a political leader, but as a leader in thought, in thinking reform of Islam, and in being convinced and this is not new. Indeed, we can refer to his writings in the 70s, 80s, early 80s, uh, that he was one of the first leaders in, in, in let's say, ref, uh, movements referring to Islam to write about public liberties, about citizenship. 
about uh, equality men and women. I, I, I still remember that in the 80, in 1980, I was still in high school and I attended one of his conferences about men and women, equality of men and women, and saying if we don't criticize ourselves as Islamists about this, we are not going to build a new Tunisia. Tunisia of, let's say, say having the same opportunity to men and women. So yes, his role as a leader is very important, but in Tunisia we have a culture. We have a culture that we share it with but the same generation, for example, my generation, for example, me and Mr. Marzouk, we, uh, we were in the same university. We read the same newspaper, and we refer to the same, always the same events. So even if we had conflicts about our projects, about the priorities, about relation of Islam, democracy, democracy, liberalism, uh, communism, etc. We can, and, and we Tunisian, we have this, I think this is a quality. Whenever we have a conflict, we, f we fight with words. We don't fight with weapons. So we can quarrel with words, etc., etc., but we refrain from going to violence. And I think this is not due to leaders, but to, due to cultures. And in specific moments of history, like this transition from despotism to democracy, we need visionary leaders. Rashid al Ghanoushi is one, but I think many others now in Tunisia. Uh, and they are working together. It's not a matter only of leaders, it's a matter of mentality and culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Shagar, I'm going to turn to you um, more with an American perspective on, uh, you know, in the, in the first panel this morning, uh, Colin Call uh, said something interesting, uh, which is that when people want the U.S. to intervene, uh, they're often asking the U.S. to intervene in a sectarian conflict on behalf of one party or another, and that that is something the United States is trying to avoid. Uh, on the other hand, you had uh, people from Arab uh, voices who said that the U.S. was in fact exacerbating uh, sectarian conflicts instead of helping create uh, pluralism. So um, I wonder what your take is from where you sit uh, at the State Department, how, uh, how um, the State Department views these issues broadly. Sure. Well, uh, assalamu alaikum, uh, and, th and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on this panel, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, <coughs> yeah, I listened in on, on the session uh, this morning, and I, th and, I, and I thought Colin, you know, I agree with what Colin said, that at the end of the day, the United States government, we have no credibility when it comes to what Islam is or what Islam isn't, first of all. We, I mean, I'm speaking as a uh, official of the US, United States government, and you know, it's not for us to just determine what Islam is or what Islam isn't. Now, I will, what I will say, when it comes to sectarianism, we have, it's, in, it's not in our national interest, and certainly not in the interest of our partners in the region to have sectarianism. There's, and you can, you know, and the ambassador has written an entire book about the you know, problems that when you have sectarianism, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it, it hurts our interest and the interest of our partners. Now, so, so then what can we do, right? That's the question. So understanding that we have very little credi credibility, and also, and this was alluded to in this morning session, that if we were to engage, and even in, let's say, constructively, we highlight a model that is actually very good, or a particular party that's very good, we run the risk of undermining the credibility of that person or that movement, right? And finally, again, I think we have a role, a very limited role, and we have to proceed with some humility, but ultimately the job of promoting pluralism is gov senior government officials, parliamentarians, civil society, the media, you know, communities. I mean, th this, is a sh this is a shared national burden. And in my country, the United States, this is not something that just, you know, I am proud that we do have a, uh, that we have a respect for pluralism. And I will say, just one, one aside, I really like the framework that the ambassador put up with those four types of pluralism. Oftentimes what we hear is a, a plural, pluralism being synonymous with tolerance. 
Uh, and I think pluralism is more than that. It's not just simply tolerating others, but actually recognizing these differences and recognizing that people with different religions, backgrounds, should be treated uh, with equal rights and dignity, including with gender. But, you know, again, it's, it's not, it, it didn't simply happen overnight. It took decades uh, uh, for this to happen. So what can we do? First of all, do no harm. I think that's really important, is that we don't do harm. And recognize that we have, a, uh, we have our own experience and that we, uh, we can certainly share that. But by intervening, we run the risk of doing, doing harm. So, and if, so be very, very careful, very mindful of that. Uh, I, one thing that we should do, and we do, we do continue, uh, regularly, is to argue stridently for human rights, for religious freedom, for pluralism. And that's part, you know, that's, we do that because it's part of our national interest, and we also believe that these, these, these principles are important. Now, what we, can, what we also can do is very strategically look for opportunities to share our model. Uh, one thing that I do is, is you know, I, sp I spend a lot of time traveling and uh, engaging Muslim communities, not only in the Muslim majority world, but also uh, in Muslim communities in Europe and things like that. Now, if you, if you think about one group of Muslims that has a vested interest in pluralism are Muslim minority communities, whether they're in the United States or in Europe, in Burma, elsewhere. Right? And so ways, you know, ways that we can share, share the approach that we've done uh, over, you know, over the years. Uh, the last thing I'd say is that um, I think it's, in, in addition to having a very good model uh, uh, to look to in Tunisia, I think there's some other models that, that are worth noting. Um, I just spent, I've, I've taken two trips to Indonesia in the last six months, and I understand that we're in the Middle East, you know, we're in Doha. But this is, of course, the U.S. Islamic World Forum, and when you think about the Islamic world, there are more Muslims in Indonesia than anywhere else. And if you look at what the Indonesians have been able to do, well, having a functioning democracy and having a, uh, this, move, this movement, and the Panchasila movement, which recognizes, now they have challenges there, but that recognizes people of different traditions, religions, living together you know, relatively peacefully. Uh, if a country with the challenges of Indonesia can do it, I think in addition to Tunisia, I think there's other models out there that, that are worth looking. Uh, and I say that as an American official with some humility that, again, you know, we certainly support pluralism. As the ambassador noted, there's not only are there, is pluralism an important end in and of itself, there are other societal benefits, uh, and frankly there's economic benefits, and sim apart from the, st the, the stability, the economic benefits of stability, in a globalized economy, if you want to trade with different people, if you want to do business with different people, having a respect for different religions and cultures is an, is an asset that will help you do that. So there's other benefits beyond the human rights. Uh, but we, we, we recognize that in many instances we need to uh, be very mindful and, very, and perceive with some humility. Well, uh, let me uh, just follow up on, on one thing. You hear, you know, in the region, and, and you started by saying it, that people don't trust that we can uh, tell people what Islam looks like, or in, in fact, for that m matter, on many other things. There's a lot of suspicion in the region, you hear it, about American intention uh, as well as uh, about American policy. And I know it's uh, sometimes we just label something conspiracy theory when it comes to intervention sectarianism, but it's not unheard of that big powers uh, do sometimes follow policies of divide and conquer. It's not unheard of that superpowers engage in proxy wars. And I think if you look at uh, some of uh, the arenas that we're watching, uh, certainly Syria, it is as much a proxy war, strategic war for regional and global powers as much as it is an internal uh, uh, revolt against an authoritarian regime. And so are we excluding uh, the, that, uh, you know, the interest of various powers, including the U.S., uh, sometimes it inclines us to, to act in ways that exacerbate rather than to help mitigate sectarian conflict even when uh, we take a, a position in principle for pluralism? Oh, that's interesting. Look. We, you know, if you just look at it, and let's speak for very frank, and the American government's national interest, right? The, the, st the, the, the stabilizing, the, the, the instability that follows sectarian violence directly, you know, impacts my country, our government, our interests, and the interests of our partners, right? It, 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 it manifests in so many different ways that if you want to take, if you want to take a very Machiavellian view, we, the conclusion is, is there's, there's, the United States has absolutely no interest and you know, certainly promoting sectarianism, right? In fact, you know, in fact, uh, you know, we've actually been working with partners in our region, including Iraq, from for for years now, 
you know, arguing stridently for inclusive government, making, you know, arguing that, look, you need to be inclusive, that you need to, uh, to take in all parties into account, right? So I, I, can, I can answer that question. It's a pretty easy question for me to answer because I look at our interests and the interests of our, of our, of our partners and the, the, the amount of instabi uh, instability, the amount of violence because of sectarian conflict, it makes it pretty, it's, it's clear that's something that we have to work against. Now, the question is, what's the role of the U.S. government? Well, yeah, we have what we know. We have a role to push and, make, a, 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 and work with our partners in the region to be inclusive, right? But as was said earlier in this earlier session, it's not just the job of the United States government. Our partners in the region also have to make sure that in their own communities that they are being inclusive, Right? And, that they're willing, and that they're willing to engage and be, make sure that people, various people, from regardless of their religion, their sect, have a seat at the table. Well, if, if I may just um, take that uh, last point and, and just connect it with a question to Marwan, which is um, sometimes uh, you, know, you, you can have uh, inadvertently in your policies lead to an outcome that is sectarian. Uh, I think the Obama administration, in the context of the domestic debate in the U.S., already says that the Iraq war the Iraq war, led by the United States, is what really led to the emergence of sectarianism in Iraq. Uh, that is a position of the Obama administration. It is also my position that I think the exacerbation of sectarianism that we see in the Middle East is a direct position, is a direct result of the Iraq war that unleashed uh, sectarianism in the region. Um, if that's the case, and, and I'd, I'd ask you this question, uh, Marwan, not so much about American policy or other countries' policy, uh, I think uh, we really sometimes get uh, confused in the debate because there's the issue about pluralism and cosmopolitanism, both as a, a you know, legally and culturally, a cultural toleration, a, a polity that is uh, more encompassing. Uh, but then we, are, what we're witnessing in the Middle East way beyond intolerance, what we're witnessing is really a, a breakdown um, that is leading to intense sectarianism. And I, why? Uh, why shouldn't one look at it simply as a phenomenon less of the absence of previous pluralism and more as a function of uh, uh, failed states and declining states? And so, and if you look at it as a function of failed state, whatever the original re reason for it, whether it came out of a, uh, an American intervention on Iraq or a, an uprising in Egypt uh, or an uprising in Syria, uh, you have essentially either totally weakened state or, in some cases, collapsed state, which then, you know, there is no national authority for people to go to. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, you seem to make an argument against stability. Why wouldn't stability be the first order of priority uh, if, in fact, uh, the absence of stability and state collapse is, by definition, the primary driver of this increase in in sectarian conflict with no end. So why not focus on stability as a policy in the short term, especially since what you're recommending would take 50 years? I would like to focus on stability. And I think stability is very important for any society. I would be stupid to say that I don't care about stability. But I do care about natural stability, not about artificial stability. What we have witnessed in the Arab world was artificial stability. Stability brought about by brute force, by authoritarian governments making sure that all the problems are kept under the lid so that if we have sectarianism, if we have political grievances, if we have economic grievances, all these problems were not seen at the surface because stability was kept by brute force. That is the kind of stability that brought people to the street in Tunisia, that brought people to the street in Egypt, that brought people to the street in Libya and in Syria and in Yemen and elsewhere. If we are to transition to natural stability, yes, it will take 50 years, but we don't need to do it instantaneously. We do need to do it seriously, though. What I'm afraid is happening today is that we are repeating the old mantra of stability at all costs. And what we mean by that is military and artificial stability, and not putting in place and developing institutions that would lead to natural stability. Naturally, this doesn't happen overnight. Of course, reform and democracy doesn't just spring uh, in, in, you know, in a region that has not known it, at least politically. 
Uh, but it does mean that we start seriously revisiting our policies, our educational policies, our economic policies, our political policies. And if people see that the government is serious about taking them through even a long road to arrive at natural stability, they will, they will accept that, in my view. I've seen it in Jordan. I've seen periods when people were convinced that the government was serious, and others when people were convinced the government was not serious, and the reaction was very, very different in both cases. I want to also make a point about def defining Islam, if I may, uh, Shibli. I think it would be very, very uh, wrong to get ourselves into the uh, question of what is Islam, defining Islam. Mm -hmm. Is it the Islam of Ghannoushi? Is it the Islam of Daesh? Is it the Islam of Hamas? Is it the Islam of Hezbollah? Well, that is a very dangerous, because probably Islam is all and none of these. Okay, it's, it, 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 uh, uh, what we should be in the business of is regardless who people want, how people want to define Islam for themselves. What we should be in the business of is people who practice politics, even if they call themselves Islamists, and all of them call themselves Islamists, and they are vastly different, of course. Even within the Muslim Brotherhood, in Egypt, they're vastly different than in Jordan, than in Morocco, than in Tunisia. If they want to talk about politics, then what are the norms of the rules of the game that everybody has to abide by? if they want to exercise power in a, in a pluralistic society. Otherwise, if we just focus on the religion, we will, we will get at a, you know, a deadlock. The, 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 the political annahda, okay, accepted the point that people have the right to believe or not to believe. The religious annahda can never do this, can never do this. So we should not get into the business of defining religion. I don't care what people want to practice or believe in mm -hmm. behind their closed doors. But when they want to practice politics, there must be rules of the game. The Tunisians have done it. Um, I'm going to uh, take questions soon uh, first to see if there are Twitter questions and turn to the audience. But Merizia, I want to mm -hmm. ask you one question while we're, we're uh, getting into the questions from the audience. Um, the, you know, when, when we look back at the first two years of the Arab uprising, it started in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. People were optimistic. They were mostly peaceful. They seemed very successful in the first few months. Uh, and, um, and you uh, tried to uh, link the relatively successful result in Tunisia to the fact that uh, Tunisian society is relatively homogeneous, mm -hmm. not heterogeneous. Uh, but a lot of the other countries are heterogeneous. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I wonder if um, our initial thought of positing the Arab uprisings as simply uh, people versus governments was just simply wrong, uh, because it's also people against people. Uh, and so when you have this public empowerment, a weakened state, everybody's vying for power. So you have everybody empowered. You have the Salafis in Egypt empowered, and you have the liberals empowered, and you have the Christians and Muslims empowered, and you have uh, you know, um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood empowered, and, and, and all the old sources of power don't go away. So it's in the weakened central authority added to public empowerment that comes out of the information revolution, the uprising, this is a prescription for more division, not for more unity. Well, and, and maybe Tunisia is the exception to the rule. What do no, you say no, to that? Not an exception, Tunisia. Indeed, uh, I spoke of frustrated identities. So, that is to say, people who could not express themselves, contribute, criticize during despotism. And then came the revolution and came freedom. And I was the vice chair of the assembly. Indeed, I, I experienced this, people against people. Political families against political families. And each political family wants to have the priority to express what they mean by being Tunisian, by democracy, by, and as if after despotism, each group wanted to build a democratic Tunisia. But each group was looking to the mirror and saying, democratic Tunisia looks like me. I am democratic Tunisia and not the other. 
But what we have learned together, and after polarization, very, very dangerous polarization between secularists and Islamists, uh, between the Troika and the opposition, and very harsh and hard debate, we learned together how to recognize each others and how to consider the other as Tunisian as me. I'm not going to judge his way of clothing or believing or praying. He is not going to judge my way of being or not like him, democrat or uh, not democrat, modern or not modern, secularist, but we are going really to uh, give life or to give, to, to, to realize this, this link of citizenship, citizenship. We are citizens of the same country. And it's really a process of learning. And we are still learning. Yes, indeed, there is a, a great deal of people against people in these Arab Spring revolutions. But how to be against the other? By idea? Yes. By project? Yes. By maybe demonstration, peaceful, yes. When it comes dangerous, when I say, I'm here and you don't have the right to exist. I want to exclude you, either by exile or by arms. This is what is dangerous, and this is not pluralism, and this is not democratic, this is violence, and we shall refuse it. Shaker, you have something yeah, to Yeah, just, just real quick, what I was gonna say, I think the point that the ambassador made, that, that we really need to emphasize national identity is, is incredibly important, right, mm -hmm. because I think what success looks like are countries where you do have this national identity. That, you know, I am, yeah. I am Tunisian. If I wear the hijab and if I don't, I'm still Tunisian, yeah. right? That's part of the solution. I think the other part of the solution is where you have recognition for, uh, you know, whether it's a hyphenated identity like we have in the United States, Italian American, American Muslim, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. But some way where you can have a strong national identity, but there's room for religious expression or ethnic or other, where you can actually, there, because if you, if you exclude that, I think that's not, that's not actually successful either, but you, but you have to have room for that while emphasizing strongly this, this national identity. Thank you. Um, see if uh, Gail, um, uh, uh, I don't see Gail. Uh, she was taking Twitter questions. Uh, if not, I'll just go directly to uh, the floor then. Uh, yes, over there. I'll take three questions at a time. So please make them brief because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, thank you. Um, um, my question is for uh, Ambassador Masher. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Munal Jundi. I'm, uh, with, uh, I'm an immigration attorney and I'm with uh, United for a Free Syria. Uh, we focus on political advocacy in Washington, D.C. for Syria. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the idea of the need to embrace nationalism uh, over any sub-identities. And, you know, uh, Professor Zarina Greenwald, Greenwald wrote a book called Islam is a Foreign Country. Uh, and she focuses, of course, on the American Muslim community, but that, you know, uh, many people have chosen to sort of look to the broader Ummah concept in order to feel like they belong somewhere. And we see that in the Middle East, obviously, whether it's the extreme of Daesh, uh, you know, saying that they want this khilafah, this idea that there was this utopic Islamic historical time that existed, or even in political Islam with Mursi, uh, you know, insisting on having Sharia defined in a, a national constitution. Uh, my, my question is, is, is simpler. What role do you think Sykes-Pico plays in maybe hesitation from the Arab world in accepting national identity? The idea that, of course, you know, false uh, artificial political lines and people sort of being squeezed into it and you know does that play a role if any in in the buy-in yeah, to national identity that's clear thank you um uh, over here and then uh, yes and then then we'll come to you in the front thank you yeah. do you hear me yes i'll stand lise howard georgetown university we've been talking a lot about pluralism individual rights and inclusivity and my question has to do with individual as opposed to group rights when we're talking about inclusivity. Um, since Bosnia, the United States has provo been promoting, I think inadvertently, a policy of including people on the basis of their membership in groups. 
And this has repeated itself in American foreign policy in a number of different conflicts, most recently in Iraq, where at the beginning of the CPA, as we know, um, Americans decided, really without the involvement of Iraqis, to establish the initial regime based on religious, ethno-sectarian, very rigid quotas. And a lot of Iraqis objected to this idea, and then we, of course, had the start of the, the war. So my question is, are we talking about inclusivity on an individual basis with individual rights, or are we talking about inclusivity, pluralism, and power sharing? Of course, Colin Call in the last uh, panel was talking about power sharing as the main solution to the problems in all of the ethno-sectarian conflicts. Are we talking about power sharing based on including people uh, as individuals or as members of rigid ethno-sectarian groups? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, clear. Uh, in the front, uh, one more. In the one more. Mr. Chairman. Uh, please identify yourself. Uh, I'm Dr. Ali Fakro. Uh, let's pose the very basic question about pluralism. And that is, can you have pluralism when you do not have equilibrium between the authority of the state and the authority of the civil society. Let me explain what I mean by this question. Since independence in the Arab world, all over the Arab world, the authority of the state has swallowed in total its civil societies they actually are within the stomach of the authority. Now, during, under these circumstances, you may have many, labor, many political parties, but they are actually, all of them are masks under the control of the authority. I mean, we have seen this in Egypt, we, see, we have seen it in, in Syria, in yes. Tunisia before, the revolution, and of course in Jordan, everywhere, really. You may have several parties, but in reality they are all under the thumb of the authority. If you take labor unions, they are the same. They are there, but they are actually under the thumb of the authority, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's so really, unless you have the a balance between the society and the state authority, yeah. Personally, I think you cannot speak of yeah, I think I think the question is very clear. Yeah. Uh, why don't we take a crack? You can answer any, you don't have to answer every single question, sure. but let's go in line. Do you want to start, okay. Louisa? Uh, and then I'm going to take uh, one more round of three. Uh, we're going to extend it by five minutes since we started ten minutes okay. late. Uh, so briefly, the, uh, the lady, th she, uh, she asked the second question, mm -hmm. on what basis inclu uh, including people? Uh, as far as Tunisia is concerned, it's clear on the basis of citizenship as individuals. Because if we include them as belonging to groups, we may be recreating sectarianism in a way or the other, as persons, men or women, citizens, equal citizens. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Professor Fahru. This is, I think, the, the, the real issue. How not to produce the let's say, the domination and the overwhelming power of the state. What we are trying to do in Tunisia is that in the Constitution, we have created, let's say, many constitutional regulatory bodies for human rights, election, uh, media, uh, uh, ecology, etc. And to give this, the membership, of these regulatory bodies to civil society, competences, men and women, and always the principle of parity from civil society to counterbalance the state. This is why I think pluralism and democracy will advance and be really entrenched and reaffirmed in Tunisia when we finish establishing all these regulatory bodies. And each time we voted, last two weeks ago or one week ago, we voted the law to establish the 
High Council of Justice. And again, we had this debate. The balance between state, authority, and power, and civil society. Thank you very much indeed. This is the issue. Uh, so, we we'll take another. Yeah, uh, well, let me, let me uh, yeah. quickly uh, respond to the individual versus group rights, and then we'll have time for the Sykes Pico uh, question. Um, so, I, look, we have to do both. It, it's, it's, I appreciate the question, I appreciate the thrust of the question. But we don't have the luxury of saying that, okay, you know, we're only going to focus on individual rights without you know, recognizing the world as it is, is that people organize in groups, whether based on religious lines, ethnic lines, etc. So, you know, the United States is found and we have a Bill of Rights. You know, we, we, we argue very stridently internationally for individual rights when it comes to religion, to conscience, for free speech, for assembly. Right? And we, we argue pretty stridently for that, uh, and, and I'm proud of that. But the world as it is, is that people have organized themselves in sects, in ethnic groups, and that's the reality that we're engaging in. So when that, when, if that's the status quo, we, we, we argue and we push that different groups ha are treated inclusively, whether it's Sunnis in Iraq, the Rohingya in Burma, you know, I mean, we, 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 it's not that we're creating these divisions. These divisions exist. That's the world as it is. And then we have to respond accordingly. Uh, to the first question, notice that I, I never use the word nationalism. Never. I use the word national identity, and there's a big difference between the two. Because if you start talking about nationalism, you might get end up with an exclusive form of nationalism that Hitler, for example, used. That's not what I mean. I mean the right to be different within a larger national identity. Uh, uh, but extreme nationalism does not allow people to be different. They want them all to think in a certain way, to obey uh, a certain leader or party, etc. Uh, so it is very important to talk about a larger national identity that is the umbrella for all sub-identities, but not to fall into the trap of advocating an extreme form of nationalism that I don't think is going to be uh, the solution to the Arab world. I agree with you that Sykes-Picot, you know, created artificial borders in the Arab world a uh, hundred years ago. What is worse than Sykes-Picot, though, today, is the dissolution of Sykes-Picot. Because some people are starting to talk to talking about the dismemberment of these countries along ethnic or religious lines. That is the worst thing that can happen. That is what Israel is trying to do an ethnically or religiously pure state. That's not what we want. What is needed is to embrace diversity, treat it as a strength rather, rather than weakness, allow people to be different within their countries, and work towards uh, pluralistic societies, in my view. That has not been done. The 100 years that separated us from Sykes-Picot have not been invested by Arab governments to forge a sense of national identity in their own. In fact, Arab governments sometimes used these divisions to basically their own, uh, to their own interest. Um, I'm in favor of individual rights. When we talk about group rights, you know, of course, uh, people have the right to organize politically. I think what the mistake that was done in Iraq is that people were given quotas based on their religious uh, 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 background only, and we ended up in a situation that resembled Lebanon in one way or the other. That's not what is needed. What is needed is to allow group rights, but to allow them to be formed along national lines, not along uh, sectarian or religious ones. And I agree with Dr. Fakhr on, 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 on the need for civil society. I'm somebody uh, who worked 21 years within the government system uh, uh, in order to try to bring about reform. I am not sure anymore that reform can be brought about from the inside because you have sort of uh, entrenched interests within the government. There are very, very few people within the system uh, that are not just serious about reform, but that can develop a critical mass within the system to reform itself. And that is why I think the only hope we have is through civil society. But that, again, is a long road. There are. I'm sorry, what I'm saying is not sexy, but there are no shortcuts to democracy. It is not going to you know, spring about overnight. It is going to take decades of hard work on the street, among people, yeah. engaged in constituent politics until that 
uh, until that is brought about. Well, I'm going to take very quick round, final round, uh, and as I said, we'll extend it by five minutes. Uh, Ambassador Lemani, and then the gentleman there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Mokhtar Lemani, the former representative of the UN in Damascus and former special envoy of the Arab League in Iraq. Uh, well, it's a comment question at the same time. Don't you think that the most important thing, you know, to have a really a pluralism is through education? Because if I try to give, we heard a lot of things about the experience of Tunisia, and I have uh, an opportunity to live twice in, in Tunisia. Uh, the first time I went to Tunisia was in 1980, and I was surprised when I saw uh, avenue of uh, Jugurta, Al Kahina, mm -hmm. you know, things that are coming from history. Because the experience we had in my own country, and I'm coming from the public school, what we inherited from the French school was very good. The uh, philosophy I studied was the international mm -hmm. philosophy. But my little brothers, after the Arabization, even geography and history was, by demagogy, totally changed. The history was coming with Uqba ibn Nafi until Morocco. What happened before Uqba ibn Nafi, we were not allowed to know. No. So through the educational system, we, we saw that uh, they destroyed everything. We were much more pluralistic before the Arabization than after the Arabization. Thank you. Um, the gentleman, for a quick question, please, if yes, possible. Uh, uh, Mohammed Sanusi, I'm with the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers. Um, I just want to bring the issue of sectarianism, and I couldn't agree more with Ambassador Morwan. Uh, in his views regarding diversity and the rich culture in this region. Um, but I am worried about the absence of mechanism addressing issues of sectarianism uh, in the region. What we see also it has a negative impact in our country there in the United States. So, uh, so, so I want to really ask because I, did not, I didn't see until now there is no uh, structure mechanism of discussion between uh, scholars of the Shia and Sunnah in the region, and we see that also not in the United States as well. So I want right. to see if you can shed any light on this and Thank come up you. with a practical uh, mechanism we can uh, avoid any kind of, uh, you know, more than we see now. Uh, we'll just take the, the last question and please make it brief because we, we're running out of time. Shukran. Uh, Thank you very Thank you very much, Mohamed Amkraz from the Moroccan Parliament. I'm going to speak in Arabic. This topic, topic of totality, uh, sorry, uh, this topic which is uh, is very important indeed. We have to accept diversity and difference in our society. This pluralism is very important. After the dynamism in 2011, the elites, sec uh, secular elite, uh, they have had a number of ideas that they did not believe in. And we have seen that uh, very much explained in reality after we have gone through. So power sharing is uh, for the preservation of our countries. This is something that should not be dealt with. Yes, there should be power sharing between institutions and agencies and not between sects within the same society. This would lead uh, to a kind of a fragmentation of society. Power should be shared by all people and in democratic manners and means. This is the uh, concept or the essence of democracy. And what we have here in the Arab region, try to be brief, please, because we do not have enough time. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, just give our panelists one final shot at, uh, at the questions, and as brief as we can since we're running out of time. Uh, we can start with you. Well, uh, I mean, totally agree with Ambassador Lamani. Education is the key. Again, that's going to be... Uh, that that's going to take time. The problem with education is not just what you teach people, but how you teach them. Yeah. And the, the, the other problem is I think Arab governments and religious opposition forces have sort of engaged in an unwritten alliance to teach people only their narrow interpretation of the truth, hoping that in doing so they would bring, you know, a generation of uh, peaceful, non-questioning, 
uh, 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 people not questioning the authority of the government. What has been done, of course, is exactly the opposite. What, what we have brought uh, up is a generation of frustrated people without the skills necessary to enter in the marketplace, and they ended up in the street. Now, how do you convince Arab governments that the only way you can bring about peaceful and prosperous generations is by quest teaching them to question you I don't know how to do that, but that is something that, <laughs> that is needed if we are to transition to democratic societies. Uh, the absence of mechanisms uh, is a problem. I mean, Tunisia has done it through social contracts, the, what I call a social contract, a new constitution. There have been attempts in the past, so far they have failed, actually, of scholars of Sunnis and Shiites coming together and agreeing on a common discourse. You have the Amman message in, in 2004 where different people came, but it meant nothing. Even Amman itself, even the Jordanian government in that same year started talking about the Shiite crescent and the Shiite threat, even in the same year that, uh, you know, we were, uh, we agreed on, on, a, on a religious common uh, discourse. The, 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 author the religious authorities themselves are not seen to be independent of governments and therefore Many people are skeptical of even these religious authorities themselves. Um, and I'll stop at that. Yeah. Any final remarks? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree on the education point. I can't add to, to what the ambassador said. On the sectarian piece, Mohammed, I think, you know, it's the 10 year anniversary of the Amman message. It's a terrific document, you know, it's very, but it, you can't just have documents. You know, you actually have to put those words into action. And particularly when the forces that are using, you know, preaching sectarianism are, are now actually using social media, using new technologies, spreading this divisive, you know, divisiveness, you know, using technologies. Whereas, you know, the people that are preaching moderation, preaching inclusivity, uh, countering sectarianism are doing it, you know, uh, using, frankly, you know, 19th, 20th century technology. And I think you have to be much more aggressive about it. You have to build not only the, the community of people together, but you have to empower them with the tools that they can forcefully get their message out to the people who need it most. Mm. Thank you, Marisa. Mm, of course, I totally agree in the value of education. And uh, thank you for referring to history in specifically. And uh, among the books I've read, and I really want to disseminate everywhere, is a book about Histor historians in France, in modern France, uh, how historians have made a league of free teachers of history. I, I, I dream that in my country, in many Arab countries, history is going to be written by historians free of any political power to say who we are, what are our origins, and how we relate to this history. And uh, uh, I usually say it's Tunisian experience. Uh, if I have only one element of Tunisian experience, I want to share with other countries where, whether they are, let's say, as united or as homogeneous as, as Tunisia or not, is if you want to write, to draft a social contract, a constitution, take your time, involve uh, civil society and learn how to listen attentively to each other to be able to enlarge the middle, the common ground on which we live together. That is a great uh, place to end. Thank you so much for an engaging conversation. These are all difficult questions that we were going to be grappling with for a long time to, go, uh, to come. And thank you all for participating.